Good afternoon, America, and welcome to the News from the Real World podcast. I'm Quinn. I'm Jody. I'm Ajitra. Today we're coming at you from the Sound Studio, and we're going to start it off with a little piece on movies. Ooh. Take it away, Jody. So, um, the future of movies in 270 degree, degree projection. This article was written by Lindsay Finlay and was found uh, at The Atlantic. Um, this was a student pick, and I actually, I found this, I found several things about this article really interesting. Basically, this guy in Korea, um, it was 30 minutes. South film. Korea. Oh, excuse me, South Korea. Big difference. <laughs> <Which> <laughs> <we> do, <laughs> yeah. There needs to be a distinction there. So, this really awesome South Korean dude filmed this 30 minute movie, and, um, it was kind of, you know, the reviews were like, there was nothing extremely outstanding about the movie, pretty standard, you know, action sequences with, Pretty shallow characters, but the effects. Um, so there were three screens. It's called in X. Screen X. Screen yeah. X. Screen, screen X. X. And yeah. it was filmed in in like a, a panorama of 270 degrees. And um, you know they were so talking you have, about. Uh, you have screens on three sides of the theater. Yes. Right. Yeah. Right. And um, I found what I found incredible about this venture was not it wasn't the artist who said, "Hey, I want to try this." And it wasn't even a production company or, or a studio that said, hey, let's try this. The, the people who came up with this are the people who own the movie theaters. It was the business proposal of the movie theaters who were like, let's see if this works. Hmm. So somebody ought to just capitalize on a new opportunity. But I still find that really interesting. And, um, you know, he, the director was talking about the intention of this being to kind of free the director and make him, give him all sorts of other options and do to be able to do more and see more and create more for the audience right. mm -hmm. but as a production person and they mentioned this in the article difficult barely <laughs> yeah I see I see it as so limiting because you can't you have to reinvent you kind of have to retweak the equipment you use and how you set it up and, and also where you, where you can physically move because you know you watch a film but the, the, the other side that you don't see is all the crew and equipment. <laughs> right. And the crew, the crew has like, services. Right. The crew has a, uh, like this a 90 degree, a 90 degree area. area of where they can live if they're filming the other 270 degrees. Yeah. I actually think that sounds like a miserable experience. Yes. Right. So it's all just crammed together. <laughs> that was kind of you know. Yeah. Um, but he said, he, he made some interesting observations about, you know, obviously, sensually, it was very immersive, like to watch the movie, um, the action sequences, and then like the quiet things were just as intense. You right. Could... Oh yeah, because they, he went on to say that um, you, it could be particularly effective in, in like right. horror or, or a moment of tension. Yeah, in know? moments of intensity, yeah. yeah. Which I guess, I guess well, I what's that what's that creeping around? <laughs> that, yeah, yeah I, I can't, but I can't see how this whole thing would make anyone's job easier, <laughs> especially because for a hundred years, we've been making movies a different way. Completely. Mm -hmm. And um, but obviously, this is something that we're heading towards. You know, people are wanting more of an immersive, immersive experience. experience. So you see it in the yes. theater, and now you're seeing it in film too. Do you think that's a result of like the instant gratification of we can watch whatever we want, whatever whatever we want, whenever we want it? And, and so, so now the we... theater needs to do something different. Right. Yeah. yeah. I think I think that that's I think that that's part of it. And they mention in this article. The expense of having to retrofit theaters to yeah. be able to accommodate this. Yeah, because you can't <laughs> just put a screen over an exit. Yeah. yeah. Or maybe you could if the screen is movable, but you can't cover the exit light. Right, yes. David Holcomb? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can't cover that light. Anyway, I, the thing is probably really dizzying to experience, but I, I guess it might be interesting. But what, what's going to be dizzying is when know. they do 270 degrees in in uh, 3D. That's what's going to be. Oh that's what's going to be exhausting. Yep. Right. Yeah. Right. So. So um, there you have it. There we have it. <laughs> uh, onwards or downwards? No, actually, uh, this next article actually was my favorite of the week. Um, it's, it's an editor pick, uh, Psychology of Horror Movies, A Scientist and Director Explain Why We Love to Be Scared. This is from Movies.com by Katie Collaudi. Um, and basically this article is a whole uh, dialogue between uh, Dean Mobs, who, who's a PhD uh, teacher at Columbia University, 
um, and he teaches a class on fear, anxiety, and biosocial behavioral uh, laboratories. Uh, and uh, Scott Derrickson, the, the director of The Exorcism of Emily Rose yeah. and Sinister, neither of which I've seen. Have you seen either of those? Yeah, I haven't seen the whole movie, The Exorcism of Emily Rose, but I have seen all of the spe special features on The Exorcism of Emily cool. Rose, which I found much more appealing. But uh, basically, this I, I found it so fascinating. This article really pinpoints what exactly are the mechanics in a horror film that, mm -hmm. that causes you to be scared, and what's the physical, uh, it, it, what's physically happening in your brain at any moment. It was yeah. kind of, it was kind of creepy. Yeah. <laughs> Again, that's that's the point of the article. But still, it was most. You're right. It was most riveting when you was reading it for that sense. But at the same time, like I guess it was most deterring, right? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's cool. It really breaks it down. The first part talks about how um, uh, you're you're often affected by the first your first experience with a scary mm -hmm. movie. Like the writer talks about seeing uh, Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom and watching mm -hmm. the guy's heart get ripped out of his chest, and that 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 image has like haunted her. And and then Scott Derrickson, the director, talks about. This cheesy movie from the fifties uh, by William Castle called *The Tingler* with Vincent Price, who who oddly looks sort of like the old Bob Dylan, with that weird mustache, uh, and uh, and how that scared the bejesus out of him and put him on this path of wanting to be a horror movie, and 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 it's kind of imprinted on you at an early age what what really plays on your own personal fears. Um, then it goes on to talk about the looming effect. Yes. Oh yeah. Yes. Think about that yes. with Jaws. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, something from a distance yeah. creeps yeah. further and further <laughs> towards you. Yeah. Yeah. It does the same thing because it starts low and soft, and then it gets uh, louder and more faster. Louder. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, but but I the thing that I actually found most inspiring was that uh, there is a certain. It's not just tricks. There there. Uh, good horror film demands uh, a certain amount of craft in terms of, of character development because if you mm -hmm. if you really empathize with a well-drawn character then that can be all the more frightening you know that like the shining well, yeah, might yeah. be a perfect example right and if you don't and if you don't if you only half ass it they're not gonna you're not you gonna deliver care, you can't, yeah, and you're totally. not gonna care and you're not gonna you know I wonder we talk about I feel like we in general, in theater, we talk about the differences between creating drama and creating comedy, and how comedy is so much harder to achieve, and like, these are the reasons why, and these are the things you need. You need perfect room temperature, you need repetition, you need, you need all these different things, but we never, I've never had immediate experience of trying to create fear. Yeah. Uh, Do you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, yeah. Um, and what elements we use, kind of, in the theatrical world to elicit, like, horror from an audience. Mm -hmm. Can you think of can you uh, think you know, experience? Yeah, I, I directed a, a new adaptation of Picture of Dorian Gray last summer, and, okay. and um, you know, there's a, the murder of Basil Hallward, and I was like, well, how am I going to do this? And mm -hmm. it was all with kind of uh, I, I used a lot of um, atonal music in the build-up uh -huh. mm -hmm. of that scene, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that sort of unsettles you, and you know, and then I had like cheesy effects, but it was a very theatrical production, right. so it, it fit the world of that. Right. Okay. Um, and then I, it just kind of was a ch tight light cue on their two faces, locked in the stabbing, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, it, the, the, the article goes on further to talk about, um, th this I actually found very interesting, uh, how the periphery plays a lot in horror movies, like yeah. things in the corner. Mm. Uh, did you guys see The Woman in Black by any chance, the yes. Daniel Radcliffe movie? I saw that one. That I movie does that, that all throughout. All the There's always something happening in the corner and you're like, oh my god, what was that? Oh, she just turned around. That There was a person in that shadow. It's so weird. Yeah. And, like, so I have to check it out. Yeah. The, corner, the Woman like, in Black, Daniel okay. Radcliffe. Actually, I was like, the Harry Potter kid? Yeah, yes. yeah, he's fantastic yes. in it. Okay. Yeah, yes. it's, it's like a all creepy... Right. Set in the Moors, turn of the century. But it looked like Black. Yeah, when it's wonderful. Black, actually, um, yeah. And then it goes on. I, the article kind of ends with how uh, fear releases something in you. Uh, it releases it, it literally uh, releases opiates from your brain. And so, oftentimes, when people leave the theater, 
of of a scary movie, they're they're often laughed and laughing. Right, yeah. right, right. Kind of cool. Well, it happened when I saw women in black I mean, like walk out the, of the cinema. And I was like, <laughs> I don't know. It was like something like we feel inside the movie, like feel inside ourselves after we watch the movie. This is like some kind of like. Yeah, release completely. That's, a bad, That's the like, opiates right? in your brain. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Moving on. Moving uh, on. The science Moving of on. opera. A teacher. Tell us all about opera. As uh, Stephen Fry hosts. Stephen Fry. Stephen Fry, the actor, hosts yeah. the science of opera. A discussion of the music moves us physically to tears. <laughs> How could that happen? So. Stephen Fry with another comedian, Alan Davies, they host a, uh, uh, have a discussion with the researcher from University College London to discuss about how like music, how an opera can like uh, bring us to like to tears to like feel to the emotion like our like inner emotions. The mechanics. The mechanics. Yeah. So, so they like they kind of like. The researcher will kind of like put sensors on them, yeah. like you know, like, like it? It all like these things, sweating, like sweating. and sweating yeah, and they like the one that like sensors, are, yes, and it's kind of like it's like heartbeat, sweats, and like Heart emotional sweat, response yeah. when they see like uh, baddies, I guess, yeah. yes, and so that's kind of uh, what is it? Uh, the the research uh, tells that music is like. The other kind of like the whole different kind of arts, like compared to like other stuff like painting or whatever. Yeah. Or, like when the neuro it's the most immediate. Yes, yeah. like uh, the neurobiologist Michael Trimble, he stated that ninety percent of people survey cry when they heard the music, hmm. compared to like only five to ten percent of people that they survey cry when they see like painting or sculpture. Totally believe it. Yeah. I, I never, I never cry when I see a sculpture or painting. Like. That yeah. never happened to me, but like music, that like, yeah. And so, what do you guys think? Well, I, you know, I think the the music bypasses this and goes straight to this, you know. Yeah. Um, and and whereas I think of painting and sculpture being something that is all about my engaging my mind yes. often, but the music just kind of bypasses that. Uh, actually, I actually, I say I probably never cried at painting or sculpture, but I've definitely cried at photography. Mm. Oh. Yeah. So I wonder, I wonder if there's something, um, I wonder if there's something about how real it is. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Like, right. For your ability music, to empathize. Right, a, mu a music has, I, I guess tangible is the wrong word, but music has a tangible quality in, in the essence that it came from someone, it came from something, I don't know, that, that wouldn't make it any more or less tangible than a painting or a sculpture, though. I, I, you know what I mean? Hmm. I, I know, I'm not doing I a very know. good job ex explaining no, it, but... Yeah, I totally know what you mean, sure. um, well, One of the things I found really interesting in that piece, that fairly lengthy video, was the section with the conductor and actually uh, him playing, you know, this kind of little phrase from Verdi and, and yes. talking about how the silences are the yes. things that actually that actually hit us yes. on an emotional level. Yes. That was really fascinating relating, to me. I mean, but relating back to the last article and the Jaws and the Jaws uh, uh -huh. sequence, yeah. the yes. silence is totally Completely. what gets you. Da -na. All, yeah. right. All you music yeah. people, I know I got yeah. those chords wrong, but you get the point. Like the chords, <laughs> the chords are there. There's time between them, and the silence is just as compelling as the sound. Right. So, right. and uh, well, maybe because as you say, music is like something that like basically like uh, it used to be one of our, our ways of communication. Like right. yeah. yeah, I have like one comment from uh, Royal. Niles, which said, music has always been the language of our emotional brain. We continue to evolve the use without knowing exactly how we want to use it as our basic means of communication. Oh, mm -hmm. I forgot. So it's, it's on a primal level music hits us. Well, our bodily functions are rhythmic too, aren't they? Yes. yes. Just like, yeah. you know, your your heartbeat ha is, is a beat, it has it a is. rhythm. It is, it is, yes. truly. You know, and there's, there's lots of other theories about you know, the movement of the spinal fluid and your nerve fluid in your body, those have rhythms too, mm -hmm. and that's why, people, that's why people do yoga. And well, we could <laughs> right. go on all day about this, <laughs> yes. but... We oh, are, oh. One is, this one is from openculture.com, and it's an editor pick. 
Excellent. Excellent. All right. Editor pick. Open culture. Uh, we'll be back in a moment with our second segment. Thank you.